There's the headline on the back of the Irish Independent today. Snubbed Cluxton is a victim of his own success. This is uh, Tommaso Shea talking to Dunica Boyle. Basically, it's the wrong decision, says Tomas. You, you'll have arguments about what Began did, and don't get me wrong, he was outstanding. It's not about that he has more than 200 appearances for Dublin, or he's lifted the cup five times as captain, which is phenomenal. Uh, it's about the greatest football team, arguably, we've ever seen, and this fella is the heartbeat of it every single game. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to go down as one of the biggest anomalies in All-Star history, probably the biggest anomaly in All-Star history, that he managed to go in 2014... Brian Whelan was hurler of the year um, and didn't get an All-Star. Okay, okay, but... <laughs> yeah. so what was that, what year was that, 90... I want to say... 7? 90, uh, 98, 98. It was one of those two years that awfully won the in the 90s, yeah, so... Um, they had to change the whole voting system after that. That like, is bizarre. I forgot oh, about sure, that. I'd say everybody's voting for Whelan, aren't they? Uh, they must be. I'm going to give them. I don't know. I can't remember who. One of the. I can't remember who beat him, but it was like a. What? Uh, okay, so the the biggest footballing anomaly in All Stars history is yeah. Stephen Cluxton not getting anything between 2014 and 2018 because arguably his distribution has got better oh. in, that, in that window. Yeah. It's not like uh, at the, the peak of his physical powers or the peak of any ordinary human being physical powers uh, meant peak Cluxton. is actually, as he got older and wiser, uh, his just amount of information and his amount of experience just added to a higher level and he hasn't picked up a single one. And like, to be fair, I think it is justifiable when you look at some of the performances David Clark put in over the last couple of years to say, yeah, Two. Yeah, I, Two. Like, the, on an individual case-by-case -case basis, I think there is uh, exceptions to be made every single year, but as no, a, as a holistic so. thing... I don't think so. I actually don't. I think that like it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how important the role of the goalkeeper is and how it's changed and how... It's the point you're making. Everybody takes it for granted at this point. Everybody takes for granted that he is going to be able to hit his midfielders in stride. It's impossible. Most counties are like desperately trying to find a forward or a, a midfielder who can kick the ball that they can convert into a goalkeeper at underage level because of what Cluxton has done. Like, there's been few enough innovations in Gaelic football that are positive, but turning the goalkeeper into this quarterback has been this stroke of genius, and it's been completely like, well, screw you, Dublin, you've got all the best players and all the money, and look at all the stuff you have. You, you can't have... No, you can't have the best goalkeeper too. Unless they pick... This guy saves some shots. Well, come on, Began's distribution is unbelievable. Uh, unless I'm sorry, David Clark. I mean, David Clark's a really good goalkeeper, but like he's not in the class of Cluxton. No, but that, that's what I mean as a holistic thing. It's weird, but I, like it's Stick Cluxton in the Mayo team. How many All Irelands do they have at this point? Like I, I, I'm just trying to two so, or three. Like you, you can talk, you can make that case for pretty much any position or any award down through the years. I can't. But like, okay, so um, g give me a footballer of the year. Bernard Brogan. Bernard Brogan. Okay, so it, it, would you say that Michael Darren McCauley is in the same class as Bernard Brogan when you look back at the Dublin teams? No. But was Michael Darren McCauley at a higher class than every other Dublin 2013? Yes, he was. So, like, bre breaking it down into individual years, you can definitely make more of a sense of what things are. You can't just say, oh, well, he, 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 there was a black mark against him because of that prolonged period where he didn't get an all-star. But I do agree. Like, he, when we look back at his career, he should probably... You, you would think that he deserves more. He's the greatest goalkeeper in the history of the game who's playing at his absolute peak and he hasn't been an all-star for five seasons. It's ludicrous. It's absolutely I, ludicrous. I wonder, do they pick the team from front to back and they get to the midfield and they're like, well, Brian Howard, Brian Fenton, uh, McCarthy's in there, Kilkenny's in there, and it's like, look at all those all-stars who can catch Seven, high balls. That's enough. Look at all those brilliant receivers. Oh. The, you don't need a good goalkeeper to kick the ball to them. <sighs> yeah, I suppose that's fair. It's a fair cop gov. Uh, the other picture on the back of the... Uh, Irish Independent. We'll come back to Cluxton, but give us your thoughts on them when we put those comments to uh, Darren a little bit later on, and we'll also uh, talk about them when we are coming back to the All-Stars generally um, a little bit later on. So there's a picture of a guy in a scream mask, which, I mean, let's face it, if you're of a certain age, is terrifying. It's Martin O'Neill. Who has invaded the pitch, and Declan Rice throws the ball at him. So, not a good sign if it is Martin O'Neill that uh, Declan Rice throwing the ball at him. It, oh, I think he misses him, though. Uh, I, I, uh, but it looks at that picture, I think he does. Yeah, not great. Come on, Declan. I mean, if you were Irish, you would have hit him. But anyway, um, the FAI are not expecting clarity on Declan Rice's international future ahead of O'Neill's November squad announcement next Tuesday. It'll be another squad announcement hijacked by Declan Rice. It'll leak out an hour before the squad announcement. O'Neill, come on. Jesus Christ. Can you just give me one squad announcement where you're not, like, completely overshadowing this? No is the answer. And then Carberry in pole position to start against the Italians. Keane Tracy out in Chicago. 
has the information that it looks like uh, Carberry's going to start. It looks like McGrath's going to be uh, nine. So uh, the old Leinster halfback pairing. Mm. It, lo it looks like Larmer is going to be at fullback as well. It's it's going to be uh, it's just an exciting team. Obviously, when you're playing against Italy's B team, there's it's hard to get too excited. But uh, yeah. the, the the Ireland team itself is is enough excitement. Life after Joe, um, we've been talking about this. Ron Lagarde sees nobody out there like Schmidt, uh, which is like <laughs> which is interesting because last week um, the uh, RFU were like, oh, we'll be grand, we can totally survive if Joe Schmidt decides to move on after being here in Ireland. We're grand. It's not one man. It's the system that's in place now that has created all the success. And well, they have to say that. I mean, obviously they have to say it, but Ron Lagarde's like, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Joe Schmidt, he the man, he the man. He absolutely the man. So, uh, yeah. like, and I, I, can, I can see why he would say that. Well, Ron Lagarde doesn't work for the RFU. If you worked for the RFU, you'd probably say it would be grand because it, it's, it does diminish your own organisation saying that it's a, a one-man body. Well, he's, not, he's, not, he's not saying that. He's saying that there's nobody out there like him. Like, we've done, everybody else is great. And and so on, but uh, there is nobody. I'm gonna find the exact quote now. So I don't think there's another Joe out there, which is fair enough. It's like, and that's why you've got to do absolutely everything you possibly can to uh, to keep him. So uh, great piece in the back, like really brilliant piece by Jack Anderson today in the back of the um, Irish Examiner Sports section. So this is the uh, Australian cricket captain who was banned for a year and. Uh, had to retire, had to resign after the ball tampering scandal came out. And there's a long piece about how they dealt with the ball tampering scandal in Australian cricket and how ultimately the players end up carrying the can for the culture of Australian cricket, which seems pretty grotesque. It's a complete win at all costs culture where um, I think it was the chief executive, the former chief executive, told the players, You're not paid to play, you're paid to win. So the only conclusion from that is, I have to win here. I'm not here to uphold the values of the game or spread the gospel of cricket right around the world and around the country. I'm not here to represent my country. I'm here to win the game and that will result in me doing whatever it takes to win because they're the rules of the game, right? That's exactly how certain sports teams around the world understand the rules of engagement are. This is a professional sports franchise. Our job is to win. I'm thinking of New Zealand. They're absolutely cynical in, in rugby in every single potential way that it is required to win as well as being the highest uh, level of proficiency of skill. But he goes on to talk about the GAA and to link these two things, um, also links in um, WADA and how corrupted WADA has come by the conflict of interest of having um, the chief of WADA be also part of the International Olympic Committee. Because the International Olympic Committee is selling the dream of the Olympics and that involves having the fastest runner, the highest jumpers, the highest stronger, the fastest, the strongest. The, the whole strongman. city, the whole country doing having a phenomenal winter games. Exactly. Uh, and WADA can't be honest bystanders watching that if they're involved in the promotion of the game. So, and then he goes on to talk about, well, hang on a second, what about the GAA? And a couple of interviews at the weekend, um, John Horn and uh, also um, Tom Ryan. And he goes on to talk about how Tom Ryan was at the weekend still talking about Liam Miller and the opening of Porky Cueve and how a lot of unfairness was thrown at the GEA. Instead of talking about the violence on the field, which is at the moment right across the country, like right across the country, instead of addressing that issue and saying, okay, we're on top of that and we're going to stand that out, it was like, well, you know, I think we were not really giving a fair crack of the whip on the Liam Miller thing. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Like, I would totally agree on the, the GEA point. The idea that a nation would say to its professional sports people that you're here to win rather than here to represent your country. Are they definitely mutually exclusive? No. There's like um, like the idea that you're there to represent your country and if you represent your country in a successful manner, which is a win at all costs culture, then you know there's nothing too unusual about that. It doesn't necessarily always have to be insidious. It doesn't always have to result in cheating. It can result in bending the rules quite a bit. You mentioned uh, the All Blacks there, getting the rubber the green off uh, referees, but representing your culture, representing your country in a, in a successful manner is never always a bad thing. No. Okay, so uh, O'Gara warns Murray over All Blacks. This is a fairly straightforward point as well. I think that we were kind of making during the week, you know, if, if um, Murray's going to play against the All Blacks, he needs to play before then. I'd say in his own head, he'd probably like two games before he's playing them. 
He's been out a long time, November 17, isn't it? It's the 1st of November now. He needs to be playing. I can't see how he'll play. I met him at the Munster Dinner in London on the 9th of October. I got the impression from him he thought he was days away rather than weeks away. Even if he starts next Monday as a full week, that's still two weeks. Well, that's easy to do if he was able to do full contact on Monday. So, needs to play. Needs to play this week. Needs to play next week. And needs to get game time uh, so he can actually be fit to play. Rice decides to defect to England. There it is in cold black and white from John Fallon. Um, he's expected to tell Republic of Ireland manager Martin O'Neill during the next month that he has officially defected England. Yesterday the story was in the star that it was going to happen. They were kind of saying he's expecting to. They're still saying he's expecting to. So it hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen. As I guess we always thought it would do from the moment the story uh, emerged. Mullins lauds his special hurdler, Lorena. Uh, Willie Mullins plans to take aim at Giants Samcro and Bouverdair in the Unibet champion hurdle with the star mare, Lorena. So that'll be um, a pretty interesting three-way uh, battle there. Emotional de Tori hails the brilliance of Enable. Um, so John Austin and Frankie de Tori stand in the cusp of history in the quest for an unprecedented pre de l'Arc Triumph Breeders' Cup double but it was the landmark defeats that lingered when they graced Churchill Downs yesterday, so uh, we'll talk about that on Friday Night Racing. Uh, Turkish Delight, Kinholt looks a sweet choice to produce a fast start in Turkey, and Roberto Martinez's odds have been slashed to land the Real Madrid job. He's as short as 9-4 to four to be the next manager of Real Madrid. That's amazing. It is amazing. Fair play to him. Uh, yeah, like... What a career path. Th here's a, here's a question. Uh, the, the biggest comparison you can make to... The decision that Florentino Perez is making right now is what sort of type of person would you hire to mind your kids? Would you hire a brilliant, suave manager, a management type, uh, kind of uh, an officiator, or would you, would you hire a childminder? I'd probably hire a childminder. Roberto Martinez is football's equivalent of a childminder. It's perfect. It's the perfect appointment for Real Madrid. You know, expensive. For a childminder. It's an expensive childminder. Just get a childminder. Uh, Darren Sherlock on Twitter says Roy Bacon has been the best goalkeeper in Ireland this year. His distribution yeah. is even better than Cluxton. Obviously, you haven't watched enough to judge. I agree. Thanks, Darren. Ian O'Reilly says Get at Dave McIntyre OTB on now to explain this decision. Five years, my God. I think he's been a selector all of those five years. I think it's like he arrived and that was the end of the, the Cluxton win. Cluxton was a, a, an all star Hoover for the first decade of his career winning five All-Stars in the first 10 years, and none since, just as they've started to get good. That's because he to make a, way more saves back then. It's as simple as that. More saves equals more gongs. Uh, back page of the Irish Daily Mail this morning is FAI in the dark. Rice says still to outline future to Ireland boss while uh, sun shines. Uh, Spurs won in the Carabao Cup last night. Back of the mirror is Hearts attack. Hibbs boss Lennon hit by coin as thuggish behaviour mars Edinburgh derby. Back page of the sun then goes with that scream mask scaring Arthur Masuaku. Hammer house of horrors. Yob's shame at London Stadium, while the back page of the Irish Daily Star goes with the Hibs or the Edinburgh Derby again. Shameful. Lennon demands action after he is struck by coin. While a couple of the UK back pages, the front of the Daily Telegraph sports section goes with sunshines for Spurs. Strikers two gold blast sets up quarter final with Arsenal and brings smile back for Maurizio Pochettino. And finally, the back page of the Guardian this morning: Spurs shadow, Tottenham residents. Fear for their future, says David Conn. The differences between club and council over regeneration around White Hart Lane leaves the locals in limbo. And you've also got Frank Lampard there. No fairy tale return as Rams own goals hand Chelsea the win. Should sure I get the right page here? So it's page 23. It's all the way into page 23. I mean, not, not a lot of readers get to page 23 of the sun. I'm not going to lie to you. But uh, so here, here he is actually in the newspaper this morning. He will be. Okay. You don't get distracted. He'll be eating his Christmas turkey through a straw. They were the only ones, the good people at the Sun, the only ones who followed up yesterday's story. And so, therefore. I know, Gostal Ae did as well. Oh, sorry, and Gostal Ae. Well, Gostal Ae. There's Gostal Ae. Exclusive Tony McGregor accepts offer to fight Tony Owen Sheehan. Uh, and they spelt your name right. That's a good, good picture of you, Owen. No, it's not, but thanks. It's an exclusive in the Goss and it's exclusive in the Sun. The, the Goss exclusive is that they saw Tony's Instagram, right? Mm, I think they spoke to Tony as they well. They spoke to Tony, all right. Because well, then the Sun is not really an exclusive because they also spoke to Tony, but they did get... Different quotes. I think they got the quote of the year. Viral sensation Tony, 59, Owen. I thought he's 58. 59. Oh, well then, I'm very confident. Viral sensation Tony, 59, is raring to go after he was called out by the off-the-ball presenter 
and is already in training for the brawl. Smack Talking Tony last night told the Irish Sun, everybody has a plan until a hydrogen bomb goes off in their face. You know, it is true. It's going to punch um, you with a hydrogen bomb in the face, Owen. I've, I've, and your face is going to explode. I did, your flesh I, will crawl. I didn't want to show any weakness this morning, but I can confirm a hydrogen bomb has never exploded in my face before, so I'm not able to train for that moment, I dare say. But uh, I'll sure as hell do my best to withstand said hydrogen bomb. There I was, minding my own business and putting in the training in Heaton Boxing Academy. I was putting the work in, slipping, ducking, hooking and jabbing, when all of a sudden young Mr Sheehan decides to call me out, out of nowhere. This guy's just having the crack, minding his own business. When you, snivelling slime ball, reptile, climb out of nowhere from whatever swamp you're from and go, yeah, I'm gonna have you, old man. You on his side? I'm gonna orphan, I'm gonna orphan his children, you said. Yeah, I didn't really think about that line, to be honest, because that would mean removing both parents from the equation. Uh, so, uh, sorry about that one. But, uh, I meant everything else I said. If I'm being honest, I think he's taking leave of his senses. Does he want Santa to rearrange his face for Christmas? That means he's gonna, he's gonna arrive in the ring dressed as Santa Claus, and you are gonna have to beat up Santa Claus. Um, what's, uh, I, I'm gonna be, I don't know. The Grinch? It's, it's gonna be like that scene in Elf when uh, Santa beats up Will Ferrell and like, uh, they smash a little Lego. Except it's gonna be the opposite of that. Um, the, the elf shall be winning this particular bout comprehensively. Uh, he'll be eating his turkey through a straw, was the one, obviously, that was um, the line from the Instagram post. I've never done boxing. My father was a boxer. It skips a generation, I suppose. <laughs> I might not have a lot of experience, but what I do have is an explosive right shoulder, and I also have to, uh, sorry, and I also have on tap any nuggets the Notorious wants to throw my way. He's no idea what he's in for. So there you go. I know exactly what I'm in for. I'm in for a uh, walk in the park. I could tune up to start my boxing career, to go 1-0 and uh, insert myself into the box rec top 100 in the world, pound for pound. Uh, New Talk presenter Sheehan, 24, got the ball rolling when discussing... How do they know my age? Somebody's leaking shit to the sun. Who? I, I don't know. It's probably you. You called me a snivelling sli slime ball just no, a moment no, ago, I'm just, so you I'm probably just, have a propensity to leak shit. I, there's no, I would not leak anything. If anybody wants uh, to tap me up for stuff, just email me. <laughs> I'm terrified. If one of those hit your head, it would explode. If one of those hit your head, it would... Kind of like the mountain and that uh, poor guy in, in Game of Thrones. Yeah, exactly. Except well, he pops his eyes out, doesn't he? Yeah, but his head kind of explodes as well. Uh, I, don't, I guess that would be kind of an unpleasant way to go. But For the sake of that old man's brain, I'd better not call him out, said Owen Sheehan. I mean, Owen, this stuff is going to haunt you forever. Like, when you go for a job like in the real world at some point, when, you know, when your media career is over, when you've finally used up all your hot takes and you have to go and get a job as an accountant or in the bank, they'll be like, you said here, for the sake of that old man's brain, I'd better not call him out. And yet you did call him out. Yeah. The, so you, you showed wanton disregard for that man's brain. I'm, I'm a walking contradiction of a man having uh, called, him, called him out after saying, I wouldn't call him out and spare, spare his poor brains, but... You know, sometimes you've got to destroy some brains to keep your own pride, and that's what's got to happen here, I'm afraid. In fairness, Tony McGregor, actually, he has some a sneaking respect for, for you, his opponent. <laughs> it's only you in the papers, this class. Right. He's up for it, I'm up for it, he has no idea what he's in for, though. There are two things in life I don't like, coinage and challenges, and he's thrown down the challenge. He's really getting into it, I have to be honest. I really admire young Mr Sheehan, but he is in for a rude awakening. Well, like, I guess there is sort of a mutual respect here between Tony and I. Like, I would kind of see Tony as a bit of a samurai, sort of uh, wise and old and very old, really. That's kind of the big comparison. A samurai who's been around the block for quite some time, has spoken to a lot of wise people, but kind of has a higher opinion of their own wisdom than really exists. So there is, a, there is a begrudging respect for Tony as well. And, you know, game appreciates game. But uh, on this particular occasion, I'm afraid I will have to make his head explode. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, we're moving on back to uh, something uh, on the breakfast menu here. The 2018 All-Stars we've done. What's this, Koi Big and Doa? So <clears throat> uh, Gianni Infantino is saying that the idea of expanding the World Cup is going to be brought forward to uh, 2022. So we're going to the World Cup in Qatar. Uh, so this was supposed to be, the 48th Team World Cup was supposed to be in uh, the year 2026. But, uh, the North American one? 
Yeah, uh, but then Infantino was like, nah, actually, we, we'd rather we get all that extra money and that extra cash and that extra worldwide acclaim and we'll do it four years earlier. So uh, it's possible. But it, like, will it happen in 2022? You know me. Uh, it is possible, it is possible, he said. So uh, Qatar, of course, are spending billions. They're building eight stadiums and constructing a huge infrastructure to host a 32-team uh, tournament at the moment. But uh, it seems that if they're going to build, essentially, a new footballing uh, industry over there, then why not do it uh, four years early? earlier? They've already got to work on it. Um, like, would you go to Qatar if you got there? No, I'm not going to Qatar. Um, he said the same thing about Russia? Uh, yeah, and I didn't go there either. You would have gone, though, if Ireland qualified. I wouldn't. I don't think I would have. I mean, in, in retrospect, I should have. It would have been a mistake. But Do you think you'd have the same retrospective view of Qatar after... Don't think so. 2022? Don't think so. Very, very different uh, reservations. At least, you know, the stadiums were there and the Russians didn't actually have to you know, abuse human rights to actually get the stadiums built, which is, I guess, a positive... Well, you, we don't know. We don't know. We, we don't know. know. We yeah. can't say anything for sure when it comes to, to World Cups, but uh, yeah, I basically just wanted to get everybody's hopes up this morning that uh, we're going to go to Doha in 2022, and uh, that's that's that. What's uh, what's next in the breakfast menu? Uh, next in the breakfast menu is what is future. So for the last, mm, well, I guess for the last couple of years, everybody has kind of looked at the whole way that WADA came into uh, existence. So WADA is the World Anti-Doping Agency, in case you're unaware, and they're the ones who are responsible for setting the policy and... Uh, implementing global policy against doping in sport. But it turns out that um, WADA has very close links with the International Olympic Committee. Effectively, the IOC invented the World Anti-Doping Agency as a shield to say, oh, we're very serious about this uh, issue of doping in sport. We, we realise that it's very bad for our sponsors and business, and so therefore we're going to pretend that we're interested in getting to the bottom of uh, anti-doping uh, uh, the issue of doping all around the world. And uh, WADA came into being and has been largely very toothless, has not got too many uh, real track record of success when it comes to eradicating doping, reducing doping, reducing the instances of doping, giving you a sense that what you're watching is clean. On the other hand, it's worked perfectly as a shield for the Olympic Games, which has continued to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, despite the fact that nobody really believes anything they see at the Olympics anymore. We tend to watch it like it is uh, wrestling entertainment. Uh, there have been calls, more repeated and strong calls from various organisations around the world, including uh, Sport Ireland. Mm. And I think, I think the minister finally... Yeah, the minister was in Washington yesterday uh, for this event. So there was an emergency meeting at the White House yesterday, which basically called on Reedy to resign as uh, WADA chief. So uh, Jim Carroll, who you know is Donald Trump's deputy director of national drug control policy, uh, he was joined by sports ministers from seven governments. Uh, so Ireland was one of seven governments that was represented yesterday, uh, anti-doping leaders and prominent athletes uh, to call for urgent reform. Uh, so they basically issued a declaration calling for a widespread reform and a robust independent requiring inquiry rather, following the recent allegations of bullying and intimidation at WADA. So it goes a little bit deeper than a conflict of interest. There's uh, been a collective loss of confidence in WADA, says, uh, says the article here from Matt Lawton in the Irish Daily Mail. Now Travis Tigart was also at this event yesterday. He of course is the chief executive of USAD. You'll know him from, I guess, being a, a big part of bringing down Lance Armstrong. Uh, he really delivered the most damning assessment of WADA yesterday. Uh, he said, normal business at WADA was no longer acceptable, adding it's time for change. Then he was asked directly if Reedy should resign. He re and he said, in relation to that question, we've called for him to either step down from the IOC or step down from WADA. You can't promote and police your sport. It's the fox guarding the hen house. We've been clear about that. It's a good line, isn't it? You can't promote and police your sport. The fox guarding the hen house. So it's, it's a fair point. You know, as you point out there, it is a conflict of interest representing the IOC and representing the dream that is clean sport and also representing the reality that is WADA and uh, anti-doping. You can't have both. Uh, you can't be the fox and the hen. No, it doesn't work. I mean, it does work if your interest is making money and helping everybody get rich. It's a brilliant way of doing things. It's exactly the way you would set up a business. If you were the mafia, for example, oh, we'd set up this shell company here that's like, oh, trying to, you know, catch all the mafioso. Oh, look, you, you know, it's exactly what you would do. Let's move on. Next uh, item on our breakfast menu this morning is rugby gluttony. Yeah, Tommy Martin in the Irish Examiner this morning asking, pondering, I guess, when will we ever reach peak rugby? Are we getting close? 
he uh, talks about the amount of games that we now see. He, he makes a lot of Krispy Kreme references here, which uh, I'm all game for. He says, the November international tests look like they've indulged in a few too many custard, or chocolate custards, I should say. I don't know, what, cho- what are chocolate custards? Um, I guess they're, they're there. Uh, things with the stuff, custard stuffed. Is it like a chocolate top donut with custard inside? I mean, I presume so, yeah. That is, that is gluttony right there. Uh, the clue is in the fact that the November International is now actually start in October and finish in December. The extra flab spilling over, spilling over like builder's cleavage from World Rugby's shrink-fit three-week official window. Uh, basically saying it's getting fatter and fatter and fatter and uh, compares it to football saying that Sean England, the Guardian, last week came up with the statistic that there were 87 live football matches available to British television viewers last week. Are we going to reach a point where rugby fans actually quite like the way uh, things are right now, which they, they probably do, or are we going to get reach a point where uh, it just spills over into uh, kind of... Apathy. Yeah. Like, do we feel that way about football? Well, if everything is important, what's important? Well, th- there is that. Like, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure have we yet even reached the point of peak football. Uh, I think it happened about 10 years ago. I think you, you can be selective. You give a shit about the Europa League. You can be selective about what you care about. If, Do you give a shit about the Europa League? If your team was in it, yes. You cared about Arsenal in the Europa League? Yes. Like, properly? Yeah, if they win the thing, they qualify for the Champions League. But, like... They've got to win those, they've got to win those games against Vorskla. Are you watching those games? I've watched, uh, I've watched every game so far, yeah. A, a full 90 minutes... Like, you're on no, your the phone. La- the last you're one. on your phone. I was on my phone for a good bit of the last yeah, one. That was probably what, the best one. Well, yeah. the, the closest one. Are you on your phone during most soccer games? All games. Well, that's just because they're. Games. That's because a lot of them are kind of boring. It, like, are, are you on? Are you on your phone because of the standard of the game, or are you on your phone because you've got an overload of football as a result of too many other games? Well, like during the World Cup, I was barely on my phone. It was like fair enough. A so, lot of excellent games. Like, fair enough, right? The World Cup, this thing that happens once every four years, had your full attention. Yeah, but. Random, okay, so your, your team is in the Europa League. Random Champions League night. Are you watching the 6 o'clock or the 5.55 and the 8 o'clock kickoff? Are you watching them both? Yeah, well, Champions League, same as the World Cup, top quality. Not all top quality. Loads the game, of, the loads games of, that I would select to watch are. So loads you, of shit teams in them. The fact that you've got this huge uh, array of options. Or are you watching the goal show? The goal show, I'm all in favour of the goal well, show. The goal show's amazing. That's yeah. just, it's like Red Zone. It's, yeah. It's just perfect television. I'm totally happy to watch that. No, I'm less happy now to sit and watch a full, like, two random teams who I have no connection to. Well, the random teams would almost make it more interesting. It's like, say if you're watching Liverpool, as much as they are attractive on the eye, it's like, well, I know everything about this team, I, I know exactly who all the players are. Whereas if you're watching two random teams in the Champions League, it's like, oh yeah, that guy plays for that team now, figuring out how the two teams set up, and it's like, 40 minutes have already gone, and I'm still, this still feels very, very novel. Uh, like I, I would certainly get that feeling with most rugby at the moment. Certainly with Champions Cup, because of the, I don't want to, the ex- relatively exotic nature of some of the teams that they play, and it's like oh they've got that All Black playing for them now. And when it comes to the November tests, like England against the All Blacks, for example, absolute bank that everybody will be watching that. All of Ireland's tests, one hundred percent. At what point does it tip into a point where you're like I'm actually fatigued with watching rugby? I think a European Super League. Like an NFL style, 32 teams, which leads to, and that season uninterrupted, and then you have the international season, will be perfect. And everybody would be happy. The players would be happy with the right number of games. There would be a huge amount of money because you've got massive TV markets that you're selling stuff in. The, um, the international boards could own a portion of the league. The team owners could own the rest of the league. The players could have a share in the league. I think from a purely spectator's point of view, the way the rugby calendar is set up now is close to perfect. Really, I really think that. So you get the start of the season, new Pro 14 year, there's a novelty in that, first couple of games you don't get fatigued, and then after the first couple of games you're into interpros. Competitive nature, really good games, all Irish players, potential in- in- test players, really interesting. Then you're into the Champions Cup, for reasons I've just said it, really interesting for two weeks. Then you've got the November tests, really interesting. Then, you go, then you're back to Interpros. Some of the November tests are really interesting. Like the game against the game against USA is interesting because they have some Irish people involved. Rugby there is starting to take off, but, but it's, it's not be, really. But it's interesting because of, a, of the uh, the rookie ish nature of the Ireland team. Like this Saturday, for example, seeing Jordan Larmer at fullback, seeing Joy Carberry starting at ten alongside Luke McGrath at nine. Like that's that there's a, a novel nature to all of that. We traditionally play three tests. Like well, yeah, okay, that, that's a point so that maybe, he, maybe this biannual trip to America becomes every second year we will play four tests 
and things start to improve um, in terms of the level of interest that we have. But like, so next year, in two years' time, they'll probably make us play the States. Like, in America, it's not really that interesting. You, like, did you watch Ireland against the States? Two years or, ago, wasn't or it? Or Ireland against Japan, no, 2017. Last summer, yeah, I did. Did you? Didn't watch Japan, I watched the USA. Japan was a bit of an awkward time, if I recall. But like the USA, that was, was that Gary Ringrose's international debut? Um, I don't know. I can't remember. But I do remember watching the game. And I remember watching it because it was, as I say, a newish Ireland team. This and I think, I think when, you're, when you're playing... I think it was on the same day as the Lions tests. Yeah, it was on later on that evening. So you had the Lions in the morning, you had the USA game in the evening. Um, so you had new players that you hadn't seen wear the green jersey before. Yeah. All right. Like, I, think there's just all, I think there's always an incentive. Okay, so you are the absolute primo. The, they would refer to you as a pig in um, as a customer because you will spend whatever. It t- well, you probably no, 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 well. no. no. The, the absolute pigs will be watching Pro Fourteen this weekend. I will not be watching Pro Fourteen this weekend. <laughs> What's Neville versus Redknapp? Uh, Neville versus Redknapp is uh, the beef of the day. If the new segment, beef of the day, and it features uh, Gary Neville and uh, Harry Redknapp. So Gary Neville had a right pop of uh, Tottenham Hotspur saying that they've been spineless for 30 years but saying that the current, uh, the current side uh, aren't so spineless and uh, you know, Harry Redknapp was on TalkSport as you do and wasn't too pleased, wasn't too plus with how uh, Gary Neville uh, approached him. He says, uh, when he managed Valencia they were the worst Valencia team probably not just in the last 30 years but in their history and uh, he also says the things about like how dare you uh, slag off the likes of Raphael van der Vaart and William Gallus and all those great Spurs players and call them spineless. Uh, just one of these public spats, once again, pundits being slammed for their views because of what they've achieved. Are, are your views of uh, Gary Neville's opinions coloured because of his miserable failure at Valencia, or should they be? Certainly in Harry Redknapp's eyes they are, much like Keith Andrews' views might have been coloured by the view that he hadn't managed the team in the eyes of Robbie Savage. Um, or gave away the ball a couple of times in the eyes of Seamus Coleman. Well, I think, so there's his analysis of a game and why it's happening, fair game. But also, it's, it's, it's now legitimate for people to go, how, how did you manage your career work out? Are you, you know, when you tried to change the culture of Valencia, how did that work out for you? Not very well, Gary. Did it? Um, so, th- are we showing the tweet now? Karen Neville tweeted, I love this new phenomenon of Sky pundits punditing on their own pundits' punditry. It'll be interesting to see who comes out of this and says uh, they told their players to get Gary Neville and he can't run and so on. Steve McCall. No, that's not Steve McCall. <laughs> Steve McMahon believes Gary Neville's comments. Here's the audio of Steve McMahon. Interesting to see what comes out in the, in the next few days and maybe coming weeks of players and managers who have sent teams out to play against Gary Neville and said, get at get Neville, he can't run. This guy can't run, he can't defend, because that's what will happen now. And, and no wonder Harry has said, and this is where he's got, he's got, he's got a monkey on his back with Valencia. Mm. So he's tough talking, fine, and I do like the way, the way he talks and a fair play to him. But sometimes you've got to reel it in a little bit, because the Valencia thing will come back to bite him. Big time, and it already is. I, mean, I think fair play, right? Like... And what Gary Neville has done is try and shut that down so that nobody else in the sky is going to have a go at him. That's the point of that tweet, right? Yeah, it probably is. He's, he's editing all future conversations saying, I'm getting paid way more than you guys are. You're getting paid to show up. They pay me, like, even on the days I'm not here. That's what Gary Neville's doing. He's throwing his big balls around the place and going, here, have a bit of that. Editorialising what other people are going to say about him reduces his opinion to actually get more coverage as a pundit. So, you know... All, all opponents want to do is make a name for themselves, sure. Well, yeah, all right. That'll be interesting to see how, uh, if um, Steve McMahon shows up again on Sky, or if he doesn't. 